Hello, and welcome to The Director Speaks, a lecture series on the history of art and culture. My name is Dr. Raphael Chacon, and I'm a professor of art history and criticism at the University of Montana in Missoula, Montana, in the Western United States. I'm also the director of the Montana Museum of Art and Culture at U of M. These short lectures are intended to share with you some of the exciting exhibitions at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, and to offer a broader context for the works on display and available through our virtual docent tours. At the end of my PowerPoint presentation, you'll see a screen with information on how to access those tours online. Most importantly, these recorded lectures are meant to bring the visual arts and their very rich histories closer to your life. So let's go ahead and get started. The lectures we're about to undertake are titled Homage to Africa. And this is a six part series that accompanies the exhibition Homage to Africa, the Tony Hoyt and Molly Shepard collections, which are currently on view at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture in Missoula from February 5th to April 24th, 2021. So allow me to bring up the PowerPoint and then we'll get started. So as I mentioned, these uh, lectures are, um, are in six parts. And we last, uh, the last time we met, we actually looked at Africa's geography and its history fairly broadly uh, as an introduction to the series. Uh, the second lecture, which we're gonna do uh, today, uh, is titled, Why Africa Matters. Uh, and so we'll look at, at particularly the relationship between African art and Western art. Um, the next lecture is actually on the Guinea coast, the famous gold coast of Africa, the western coast. Uh, the fourth lecture is on Ile Ife in the Benin Kingdom within modern day Nigeria. And that lecture continues into a discussion of the Yoruba people of Nigeria in our fifth lecture. And then the final, uh, and the final lecture of the series is called Southern and Eastern Africa. So I'm glad you can join us on today's topic, which is why Africa matters. So African art and its relationship in particular to modernism. So to answer the question why Africa matters, it's important to understand that African art matters sui genitus. That is that the art matters greatly to the societies that created it across thousands of years without the need of approbation from the outside world and certainly not from the Western world. However, African art has mattered a great deal to the West, uh, particularly um, from the late Middle Ages, starting in the 16th century or the 15th century forward. Uh, African art has entered Western collections in, in a number of different ways. And those ways have in fact significantly altered the course and the direction of Western art. The first point is African art entered the West as exotic curiosities. And these were essentially trade items brought into Renaissance Europe, uh, where they were collected, exhibited, discussed, and in some ways helped to shape the, the course of the art of the West. Um, the second part is by uh, during the colonial period, when huge portions of Africa were colonized by Western powers, uh, African art was uh, a symbol of that colonization and that the hegemony of Europeans over the African continent. So much of African art, particularly the things that we tend to see in Western collections today, was actually thought of as booty from uh, punitive expeditions, from conquest, uh, from essentially the, 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 uh, the exploits of the colonial powers in the African continent. And the third way, and this is what uh, today's topic is really about, is that African art was one of the great catalysts for the creation of modern art in the Western world. In fact, I would argue, and I think most histo historians and art critics would agree with me, that really there wouldn't be any Western art, any modern art in the West, uh, in the way that we know it, without an enormous contribution uh, from African art, the participation of African artists, whether willingly or not so willingly. African art has in fact influenced the West greatly, particularly in the 20th and into the 21st uh, centuries. 
So the first thing that we should talk about is the term primitive, because that's often the way that Westerners have discussed uh, African art. They lumped it in with a category of art that came from the third world, what is called the third world or the undeveloped world, or otherwise known as the primitive word. The, pr the term primitive is essentially a pejorative. It implies that European civilization is superior to the civilizations of the rest of the world. And it was a term that was commonly used in the late 19th and early 20th century by Westerners. However, the term itself does not describe the reality of any of those civilizations and those cultures that created uh, very, very rich and wonderful arts. It is in fact a Western fantasy. It is an attempt on the part of the West to describe societies that were uh, relatively unknown to them. The term doesn't have any currency today. No one talks about the, wor the work of the rest of the world as primitive um, because we see it for what it is. It's, a, it's an imperialistic term. It actually uh, says more about the hubris of Europeans uh, than about the values and the integrity of non-Western uh, societies. So the image that you have before you is in, in fact an image of the notion of the primitive, that is large collections of works, works of art from Africa that were collected by Europeans and displayed as evidence of their power over these societies. So there is indeed a definite relationship between um, Western European art, particularly uh, modernist art of the early 20th century, uh, artists like Pablo Picasso, Henri Matisse, and many other members of the avant-garde, and traditional African art. It was a, what I call a selective appropriation of that art. And by the way, this field, this, I, this uh, field of scholarship, that is the relationship between African art and modern art is in fact a very, very rich and fertile field. Uh, and, and a lot of it was initiated in uh, the mid 80s. In fact, in, in a great exhibition, uh, a controversial exhibition titled Primitivism uh, in, the art, in, the 20th, in 20th century art, which was held at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Uh, a highly controversial exhibition, but one that really probed the relationship and the influence, if you will, of non-Western uh, traditions, traditions beyond the Western, uh, the Western um, series uh, and its influences on, uh, and their influences on uh, Western art. So crediting African art, and it's particularly, it's the, 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 the high levels of abstraction um, in its influence on European modernism is really no longer controversial as it was uh, a few decades ago. Uh, in fact, if you look at Wiki the Wikipedia entry on, uh, on African art uh, and modernism, uh, you can actually see, in fact, how popular this idea is. Uh, Wikipedia lists, for example, that Pablo Picasso between 1906 and 1909 had an African period, which they call sometimes the Negro period or the Black period. The reality is that this period lasted a lot more than just three years. Um, abstraction at, uh, gleaned from African art was an enormous part of Picasso's opus preceding this period and continued well into the rest of his career. But it is true that by the time that Picasso began developing what we now consider modern art, non-objective abstract art, that Africa had been essentially carved up by European uh, colonial powers. By 1914, for example, 90% of the African continent had been colonized by European powers. And that co colonialism included the looting and the trafficking in African art. Picasso and his contemporaries, the avant-garde members, whether they were Spaniards or Russians or Frenchmen uh, living in Paris and, and the other capitals of Western Europe, had great access to African art from the, uh, this scramble that had taken place between the colonial powers at the end of the 19th century and from the, the loot that had been brought back uh, from the colonies to uh, the European capitals. So artists like Picasso and Henri Matisse and many, many, many other uh, artists, um, not just in France, but also in Germany and in Belgium and in uh, England, um, began to look uh, very carefully at, uh, at the art of Africa. And therefore, African art is in fact foundational to the understanding of non-objective or abstraction in the Western world. There would be no modernist aesthetics without it.
art critics, such as the Englishman Roger Fry and Clive Bell, two very influential uh, uh, British critics uh, in the early 20th, uh, 20th century, devised a methodological approach to look at the, the, this modern art, this abstract art, um, and that eventually became known as formalism. Uh, basically, what they said is that all works of art possess significant form. That is, that they have a clever or ineffective arrangement of formal properties that, in fact, evoke an emotion on the part of the viewer. That allowed critics to look at all of abs uh, Western abstraction, but it also significantly allowed everyone to look at non-Western traditions beyond uh, the West uh, for these properties, these formal properties of abstraction. It was a way of validating within the West, validating that art which was called primitive, which was thought beneath them, and yet still highly expressive and important in, in terms of human creativity. One problem with the formalism of Roger Fry and Clive Bell, it left out the significant, uh, the meat, if you will, the content of this African art or non-Western art that these artists were looking at. In other words, they left out the social, the political, the religious, the philosophical context, the meaning, if you will, the heart of this art. And they basically simply appreciated it for its formal, for its formal properties. And then it allowed them, it catalyzed, in fact, the same sort of formal explorations in their own Western art. For example, here is uh, Pablo Picasso's famous painting, Le Trois Femmes, uh, one of the early Cubist paintings which he was developing in the years 1905 to 1906. And here what we see is figural abstraction. The faces that you see on these, uh, on these female figures are in fact uh, figures drawn are, are drawn from African masks. And these are some of the examples that Picasso had access to early in the 20th century. Uh, these masks, however, were only used as catalysts for the abstractions within the Western context uh, in terms of for, as formal devices. In other words, Picasso really wasn't interested in their original context. Uh, what their, their spiritual, religious, any of the meanings uh, and the functions that these, that these masks played in their original societies. The masks that I just showed you that were so influential for the development of that Cubist painting actually stem from the Dom people of Ivory Coast in Liberia. And these are known as Diangle masks that represent female forest spirits. So these abstracted, beautiful faces represent these peaceful spirits which soothe initiates in the process of uh, their initiation ceremonies. But that context really was of very little interest to Picasso. In fact, Picasso talked about how in his, um, uh, in his first visits to the Trocadero Museum, uh, now the Musée de l'Homme in Paris, where all of these vast collections of African art were held, that he was literally repulsed, uh, that he, he felt in fact uh, like he wanted to vomit from the scent, the smells of these collections. And still, he was so drawn to them that he returned repeatedly over and over and over again to seek inspiration from, um, from what he was seeing with his, his very eyes. So again, the context of the mask, in this case, you see a Diangle mask in, uh, worn by a ritual performer reenacting um, uh, the, the primordial myths of the society, talking to the initiates, talking to the village, uh, costumed, hidden, if you will, from, uh, uh, from everyday life or transformed from everyday life into uh, a spiritual being. That context was really of very little interest to Picasso and his, uh, and his cohorts. Really what mattered most to them was in fact the, expressive, the expressivity, uh, the, formal, um, the formal abstractions which they were witnessing in, uh, in, this, uh, in these sculptural traditions. And those masks and those sculptures that they collected and looked at and studied would catalyze um, great and important movements in abstraction in the West. This is, of course, is, uh, Picasso's very famous breakthrough painting, the first sort of publicly exhibited monumental work by Picasso in this new Cubist style. And there were many, many influences here, not just African. Uh, uh, for example, we, we notice that there are uh, allusions to Michelangelo here, to the, the Spanish painter El Greco, uh, allusions to, uh, to Iberian art uh, that is from the Spanish, uh, the Hispanic Peninsula uh, from uh, even before the Roman times there. But there is clearly allusions 
to the art of Africa, which he was witnessing directly in the collections that he, uh, that he studied and analyzed uh, and appropriated early in the 20th century. These are just some of the examples that were, uh, that were heralded actually in uh, the, the mid-1980s in that primitivist exhibition in, uh, at the MoMA in New York City. Some of the masks that were actually direct inspirations for uh, Pablo Picasso's uh, famous catal uh, uh, catalyzing painting of, uh, for Cubism, for the movement of Cubism. And that it wasn't just that painting, there were scores of paintings and drawings and sculptures that would attempt to, uh, to borrow themes, elements, uh, particularly when it came to figural abstraction from African art. There were lots and lots of formal uh, devices that were borrowed uh, from or appropriated, if you will, by Picasso and his, uh, and his contemporaries uh, to catalyze their own work. There on the left, a painting of, by Picasso of the head of a man, and on the right, it's African source. Uh, the same thing with this portrait uh, of a woman on the left and the mask that you see there on the right. Um, same thing with a painting like this. So in that period, of that crucial period between 1906, 1907, 1908, what we see is copious borrowings, if you will, uh, of African uh, sources, among others, but, but primarily African sources for the art of an, art, uh, of an influential artist like Pablo Picasso in the Western world. And Picasso wasn't alone. I offer you here the work of uh, Henri Matisse on the left, the famous portrait of Madame Matisse. And its source, uh, literally the mask that you see there on the right, became the source for the portrait of, uh, of his wife. Um, Notice, of course, that the, the painting on the left is not a representational likeness in the traditions of the Western world. It's in fact a, almost a direct, almost a literal borrowing from, uh, from an African uh, tradition. Uh, here is a, a, a watercolor sketch on the left of that same, um, one of the predecessors to the painting. Uh, and then you see on the right, a mask from the Fong people of Gabon, which um, was the source for that uh, uh, very beautiful, very placid image that you see in the uh, in the modernist painting. Um, Picasso uh, not only, uh, excuse me, Matisse not only looked at masks, he also looked at figural uh, sculptures, uh, particularly reliquary figures, uh, images that that uh, were often uh, contained or held in uh, in African village shrines. Uh, for example, this is a very famous painting of bathers by the river. And many of the, uh, the, the gestural moves that you see, the abstractions of the figure that you see here, are, were drawn from the kinds of abstractions that we see, both in terms of proportion, um, physiognomy, um, figural types, et cetera, uh, that, uh, that Matisse and other modernists looked at in African uh, sculpture. These are actually co uh, a collection of African sculptures in one of the avant-garde artists' uh, personal collections. An individual like Alfred Stieglitz, a member of the European avant-garde in the first quarter of the 20th century, was keen on looking to African art and exhibiting it simultaneously alongside modernist art so that one could appreciate the connection, the kind of the formal dialogue between uh, the abstractions of a contemporary Western artist and the abstractions of their African predecessors. Uh, so, for example, there on the right, you see an exhibition held in New York City at the famous Gallery 291, uh, Stieglitz's own gallery in 1916, uh, where we see drawings by Pablo Picasso uh, as, uh, alongside sculptures from, uh, from Africa. Uh, these are the sculptures, actually, that, that, uh, that were borrowed. These are known as Bieti figures, and they were part of also from the Fang uh, tribe of Gabon, or the Fang people. Uh, and these were images of uh, Fang ancestors, venerated in shrines as protective figures by the community. Uh, again, the context and the, the original meaning of these were less important than the figural uh, statements or the figural gestures, the, the, uh, the decisions made by, by, uh, by the traditional artists. That's what interested these Western artists. They left aside a whole wealth of knowledge, a whole a set of important um, uh, data in favor of simply the appropriation of a formal, uh, formal devices. Uh, again, the, the predecessors, the sources for uh, much abstraction in the Western world.
Um, the, uh, Matisse in his late days was well known and celebrated for um, a series of cutouts as they uh, as they came to be known uh, and these cutouts he was heralded as having kind of moved uh, western design uh, western art making into this uh, much more decorative uh, and uh, kind of uh, lusciously colorful and beautiful um, direction uh, in his late work and also it, it was subject to you know his infirmities in his late days when he couldn't paint he couldn't hold the brushes uh, quite well so this became a way for him to continue his creativity. Um, there, um, this did not spring from, uh, from his own creativity, from his own mind, like, uh, like a fully formed Minerva from the head of Zeus. It had predecessors, and it had predecessors in African art. Um, it's ironic that the textiles that I'm showing you today, right here on the screen, are uh, known as skirts, uh, because indeed they are large pieces of fabric that were worn uh, around the body as uh, as skirts. It's ironic that some people call these uh, Matisse cloths um, because uh, the irony stems from the fact that Matisse actually looked to these cloths to inspire um, his famous cutouts of the uh, of his late career in the 1950s. So um, so really Matisse's cutouts should be called. Uh, Cuba-inspired cutouts because they derive uh, quite directly from the, uh, the the patterns, the designs, the inventiveness, the creativity of the Cuba people, specifically Cuba women, uh, who made these uh, these skirts in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. So, um, so we have our our sort of our our influences mixed up. A little bit. It's these Cuba cloths that were influential for Matisse, not the other way around. So it's ironic that um, that although the French and, uh, and and much of Western Europe paid homage, understood the power and the value of African art and validated it uh, and approved of it. Uh, so much so that they imitated it, and of course, imitation is the highest form of flattery. It's really the Nazi party, the very racist uh, Nazi party, that uh, in some ways pointed out how truly significant African art for, was for the, uh, for the West. So much so that they repudiated and they did everything possible to eradicate that, uh, that African presence uh, in, in Western European uh, art and civilization. So what I'm showing you here are, are uh, scenes of photographs from the opening of the great German ex art exhibition held in Munich uh, in the late 1930s. Um, and you see images of Adolf Hitler and his henchmen um, who were, uh, in their opinions, quite cultured, um, uh, celebrating the art um, that they felt was in fact truly European and valid in the West, the art of the ancient world, uh, uh, bombastic images of idealized, heroic, superhuman beings, uh, the kind of Aryan uh, uh, idealizations, um, an art that we today look at and say, this is pretty much retarded terror. We think of it, this is junk art because it's really not much of it is inspirational. And it's certainly all of it is polluted by um, Aryan ideology and suprematist and racist uh, ideas of the superiority of European uh, races. But the, the, the Nazis were quite aware of the power of abstraction and the power of African art and non-Western art uh, over the avant-garde in the West. And so they not only repudiated the avant-garde, but they repudiated its sources. And here you see evidence of that. Simultaneously, as they were promoting this horrible, um, uh, disgustingly racist art as the ideal watered-down classical art, but nevertheless the ideal art of, of the new order, um, they were also uh, trashing the art of Africa and its descendants uh, around the world, and certainly trashing the embrace on the part of Western Europeans of that uh, of those traditions. And these are, in fact, images from the counter exhibition that the Nazis quite cleverly hosted, and that was the exhibition of Entatete Kunst, or degenerate art, as they called it. And they lumped in the African sources with the art of the insane and the art of uh, of, of 
any source that was not in fact Western European, uh, the Western European classical tradition. These are pages, by the way, from the catalog uh, or the, uh, the, uh, the handbook to that exhibition. And as you can see from the image on the right, these exhibitions were free and, uh, and Germans were actually invited to come in and deride the avant-garde and to deride its sources and therefore deride anything that was not in fact Western European uh, classically inspired. By extrapolation, they were actually deriding that uh, highly influential African art that inspired so much of it. And not only did they deride it, but they literally destroyed it. So uh, as a part of this uh, purging, if you will, of the, the uh, African sources of of Western art, they destroyed much of the of that art, uh, uh, including uh, the art of its own uh, of its own artists, uh, Germany's own uh, great expressionists who had embraced uh, African and non-Western sources early in the 20th century. So, but there are, in fact, uh, in in a great many ways, uh, African art uh, it was inspirational to to the Western world, and certainly after um, after the collapse of the uh, the Nazi Party and and that regime in World War II, uh, Western Europe and the rest of the world, um, the rest of the free world, I might add, uh, went back to indulging itself in these appropriations of African sources and, uh, and went back to the, uh, the traditions of abstraction. Uh, so it wasn't, just, uh, it wasn't just early in the 20th century, uh, the, the second half of the 20th century was also a fertile period for, uh, for the, uh, the coming together, if you will, of the uh, African sources and the Western tradition. And I want to point out that this was not just figuration. It extended to many, many themes in, in Western art. For example, the Dutchman Piet Mondrian and the Uruguayan Joaquin Torres Garcia uh, were both very interested in this idea of the grid. And, and whether, whether serendipitously or intentionally, uh, we see, in fact, great relationships between the, the grids of modern abstraction, uh, or Western abstraction, if you will, and the grids of, of African art, especially the work of the Dogon people of, of Mali. And a similar theme, similar ideas behind the use of that grid. The grid as the ideal or kind of perfect form, which implies a kind of utopia for humanity. So, and I want to add, in, in a minute, I'll show you some images of that, of that idea, some articulations of that idea, both in its African context and in the West. Um, but I think there are, in fact, ways of, of being optimistic about this. Um, it is clearly a case of Westerners appropriating ideas and imagery from uh, the African continent. But today, interestingly enough, with so much of contemporary art being relational, so much of it being a, a social interaction, so much of it being socially engaged, what we see is that we're finding even more and more uh, correspondence, similarity between uh, the practices of contemporary postmodern artists and the traditional practices and the traditional context of African art, which was indeed a social interaction, which was indeed relational. And that is fortuitous because it means in some ways that Africa is even more intertwined with, uh, with contemporary uh, practice in the rest of the world. So, and there are in fact good sources among art critics today for that, uh, for that conversation. So going back to that concept of the grid, I just wanna show you how compelling these images are. This is a Dogon elder, uh, a shamanic figure actually creating uh, a, 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 a temporary grid, if you will, on the ground. This is a, a, a part of an ephemeral artistic tradition that in fact articulates the harmonious, the peaceful, the balanced society. So what we see on the left is in fact the drawing on the earth itself um, of that kind of harmonious grid, which is representative of the Dogon community as a whole. And it's that sense of idealization that is a parallel, that's a very strong parallel, uh, that finds a strong parallel in the art of an artist like Piet Mondrian or Joaquin Torres Garcia in uh, working in South America. So wonderful correspondences, uh, more often than not serendipitous, but nevertheless, a similar sort of attention to, uh, to, uh, to similar themes, uh, conceptual ideas.
again, the Dogon uh, craftsmen uh, building the grid uh, as, represent uh, as representative of the communal order and, uh, and Western Europeans achieving a kind of utopic order in their own, uh, within the confines of their own paintings. And of course, in Africa, that concept extends well beyond uh, ephemeral art. It, it extends to architecture, as you see here in these Dogon, uh, these spectacular Dogon houses. And again, we see rational order, the systematic organizing of space, uh, as emblematic of the order of the human uh, community. And we see it in their, in specific works of art among the Dogon. These are granary doors uh, carved where we actually see images of the Dogon themselves, those important elements of their world, both uh, human and animal, uh, that in fact, that form the greater community, repeated over and over and over again, like in a, uh, as if in a grid pattern. And this is one that's currently on view at, in Missoula in our current exhibition at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture. So I will actually end here on this note and invite you to visit us at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture at uh, museum at mso.umt.edu, museum at mso.umt. Edu. And if you can't visit us live, I want to invite you to take a virtual docent tour. And there are actually two concurrent exhibitions, the Tony Hoyt collection, and you can click on this image or actually, or, uh, or, uh, or put it into your, uh, your, uh, your search uh, engine uh, and look for that. Uh, and you can take the virtual tour of the Tony Hoyt exhibition or the Molly Shepherd exhibition. Thanks again for joining us today. And we hope to see you at our next installment of Homage to Africa.